You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we were just having a conversation. <laughs> so. um, okay. So you want to go with this? I will. Um, also at the top of the closing statement, you'll see the name and address of the borrower, name and address for the seller, name and address for the lender, your property location, which will include the uh, property address as well as the legal description. Also, you'll see the settlement agent, so that's where you close. So say um, you represent the buyer, they go to list it up with you a few years later and you want to remember where you closed, you can just pull up the closing statement and you'll see. Also, it goes over your settlement date and disbursement date. And the, disbur the disbursement date is the actual date that the file disperses. Settlement date can be different if you have a buyer or seller that signs prior to your disbursement date. Is that is disbursement the same thing as funding? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So. Okay. So we send this, once it's been approved, everybody gets a copy and a lot of times a loan officer will go over the buyer's figures with them prior to closing, but we always go over it at closing. Just a lot of times us just talking through the figures will answer questions mm -hmm. that they may have. So we go over it in detail. Um, let's take a look at the seller side first, which is on the right, and it's going to have the sales price and then um, any credits to the seller. So in this case, there's a homeowners association fee of $350, which is on line 409. And most often, the homeowners association fees are paid for the year up front. So this seller has already paid that fee for this entire year. So from the date of closing until the end of the year, there's a proration done where the buyer credits back to the seller the portion of that full homeowners association fee. And so any, the sales price plus any credits are added down to come into the gross amount due to the seller, which is the 451.08.36. And the next section shows any reductions in the amount due to the seller, and it's going to start with the 27.481, which is the total of their settlement charges. And if you look at page two, <coughs> it will give them a detail on what that is. And again, the seller side is the right-hand side. So it's starting at the very top with the 27,000, which is the total of the Realtors Commissions. It'll show a total there. It does not show what the percentage is, and it does not show who's get paid, being paid what part of this. It just shows over to the left, it'll show how much of that total is going to one broker and how much is going to the other broker. Um, but it doesn't show, like in, I know for Remax, you have a commission disbursement letter that shows you'll get a portion and your broker gets a portion and a lot of the agents give a donation to Children's Miracle Network. It doesn't show how much of that total goes to each one of those parties. Okay. Later on, on one of the back pages, it'll detail out who got paid out of that, but it never shows how much. Okay. So your, your commission split with your broker is your business. Okay. Um, so moving on down then, the $81 is part of the title company cost. And that includes our tax certificate, and it also includes a e-recording fee for any documents that they had to have recorded, and if there's a courier fee to the seller. All of that's included. The 250 is our closing fee, and the $100 is to the attorney for preparing legal documents. Typically, that's for the deed. Um, if they had to have a release of a lien prepared, it'll be more than that. So usually, it's $150 to $200 there. And then there were no other collections from the seller, so their total is $27,481. And we just match that back on page one. Um, the next figure there is the payoff on their current mortgage. So while we were processing the file, we ordered a payoff statement from whoever their loan is with, and that's the amount we have to collect to pay them off. Um, the $100, um, most contracts have an option fee on them, and the buyer gets a credit for having prepaid that, so it's subtracted from the seller's proceeds. Um, it looks like there was an amendment to the contract where the seller agreed to pay $1,200 toward the buyer's closing cost, so that's what the seller contribution is. It's a charge to them here and given as a credit to the buyer. The $2,819 is the cost of the title insurance policy. Most contracts show that the seller's paying for that. 
And the way this the settlement statements are done, it's shown as a buyer charge, and then the seller gives them a credit. So that's what they're doing here. Is the cost of the policy a percentage of the sales price? It is. There's a there's a rate chart here. Mm -hmm. okay. The rates are set by the yeah, mm -hmm. and they're set by the state board of insurance. So it'll show you. I think it actually gives you a chart. It's okay. right under. Got it. Up to a uh, up to a hundred thousand dollars sales price, and then it gives you the formula on how to figure it out. Okay. Thank and if you have Chicago agent, mm -hmm. okay. yes, um, all over the state of Texas, mm -hmm. our rates are set by the state board of insurance. So, any title company anywhere in Texas, it'll be the same rate. Um, okay. And then the other, the next figure down, the eleven three twenty five fifty. That's where we're prorating the property taxes. Depending on the time of year, you'll see that in a diff different places. If the tax bills are not out at the time of closing, then the seller will give the buyer a credit from January 1st through the closing date for their portion of this year's property taxes. And so that's what's happening here. Um, as we get later in the year, there will come a day when all those tax bills for this year are out. So what we have to do is collect from the seller for the tax year, and you'll see that as a proration the other direction where the buyer will give the seller back the remaining portion of the year so it just depends on when we're closing so are, are taxes paid in arrears they are yes okay. yes so when the bills come out probably about the middle of next month for 2013 is when we'll start having to do our settlement statements a different way most of the year you'll see it like this okay. so then we're going to add together everything that's a collection from the seller so their proration of their taxes all their closing costs and their payoff which is that 164, 441, 50. And that little bottom portion just recaps everything we've already gone over with them. So everything that was a credit to them, less everything that was a charge to them, and then it comes down to the bottom line of their proceeds. Any questions? <laughs> yeah, that would be the next statement <laughs> in, your, in your closing to the seller. <clears throat> and then I'll let Tiffany go over the buyer's side. Okay. The buyer side, all of your credits and debits are going to be on the left side of the page. We'll start on line 101 with the contract sales price debit of $450,000. Next on line 103, we have your total settlement charges of $28,608.32, which if you flip over to the second page, I'm at the back side of the page. I know. At closing, we put these two pages on the front and back of one page. So if I say, try to save a little bit. Yeah, we try to go as green as possible. So you'll see on line 803 that we're collecting $5,095 for origination charges to this lender. Um, on line 804, on the inside column, you'll see POC $350. What this means is that the buyer paid $350 for the appraisal outside of closing. They gave a check to their lender. So on line 805, we're collecting $50 for the credit report. On line 901, we're collecting interest from our funding date, which I put today through the end of the month for a total of $791.12. On line 903, we're collecting the homeowner's insurance for one year for $1,950. And then on line 1001, the total amount to set up the escrow account on this one was $16,091.50. And that's made up of line 1002. We're collecting three months of the um, monthly insurance for $162.50 for each month. Next, on line 1004, we are collecting 12 months for the property taxes for $1,367 each month. And then on line 1008, the aggregate adjustment credit for $800. Why would you collect 12 months of taxes? If you close in September, your first payment's not going to be due until November 1st. So they're collecting the whole year. Yep. Um, plus, uh, they uh, collect an additional two or three months, depending on the lender. To set okay, up so it's the time of year that dictates mm -hmm. how many months you're collecting. Exactly. So okay. in January, it would be two or three months that okay. they would collect. Okay, I got it. That's normally what I'm used to seeing when I buy. And 
All of the numbers that uh, Tiffany already went over are things that are given to us by the lender. So that first section was all of their closing cost. The interest depends on the terms of the loan. Um, the insurance, typically the lender will send us the insurance invoice because it's something they needed to get for their processing. And then if there's an escrow account, they give us all of that in their closing instructions. So on line 1101 is the total title service fees, including the mortgage title policy and all lender required endorsements, which comes out to $578. I'm going to have you flip over just so you can see what that's made of to the form that's the HUD-1 attachment. It looks like this. And those charges are made up of um, there's the breakdown. Line 1101 detail, there's a $16 courier fee, $6 e-reporting fee for a total of $22 on line, line 1101. And then on line 1102 is our closing fee to Chicago title for $250. And then we're going to skip the line 1103 detail because that's not rolled up. But we're going to go down to the line 1104 detail and that's the total cost for the lender's title policy with all the typical endorsements that are required by the lender. So that comes out to $290. And then the last item on line 1111 detail, a $16 document copy fee. So when you total up the $22, $250, and then the $290 and $16 charge, it comes out to that $578. Why is the owner's title policy so much more expensive than the lender's policy? Because it's based on the sales price and we're doing what we call that simultaneous issue. So they're being issued at the same time. The owner's policy is the more expensive. It's based on the sales price. The lender policy gets quite a discount because we're issuing them at the same time. Um, if it was a refinance and we were only issuing one policy to the lender, it would be based on the loan amount and you would see that it was more in line with what the owner's policy cost. And so. if it's the typically the seller who pays the owner's title, and it's the buyer who's paying for the lender's insurance? Correct, okay. yes. It is negotiable as to who's gonna pay for the owner's policy on your contract. Mm -hmm. you, you mark a box, but most of the time it's the seller. Okay. So we're gonna go back to the second page of the closing statement. On line 1103, you'll see the owner's title policy charge from the buyer for $2,956.70, which the majority of that is being credited back for the owner's title policy. Everything is being credited back minus the T3 survey endorsement charge. Okay, I have one more question. It's almost more of a statement okay. because I'm really trying to wrap my head around this, why the difference in the cost. Right. And is it because the title insurance company's liability is virtually covered by the owner's title policy? So by issuing the lender's policy, you're not increasing your liability. Well, that may be the thought behind it. Um, I haven't ever analyzed that before, but really it's because the State Board of Insurance mandates that there is a simultaneous issue credit. Yes. So if these policies are being issued at the same time, right. the State Board of Insurance mandates that there will be a discount on the second policy. So if the, if the title policy value is $600,000, okay, and you have an owner policy and a lender policy, of, and say the lender policy is five hundred, dollars because that's the amount of the loan, right. you're not going to pay out a total of $1.1 million if there's a claim. Mm, good. good. Really? Cause you, yes, because they're two separate policies. So... But the lit, okay. Yeah, because the, the new owner, the buyer, is covered under their policy for that total of 600000 mm -hmm. and their mortgage company is covered under their separate policy for that 500000 Okay, so my theory doesn't work. All right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we are researching the same title to issue both policies, so you're, you know. Okay, that's right. On line 1201, we have the total government recording cost. So this is what it actually cost us to record um, the warranty deed, deed of trust, and water district notice, if there is one, for $121. Now that number does fluctuate depending on the number of pages of the document being recorded. Um, down in the bottom on line 1302, I'm collecting $450 for the survey. 
On this one, I put the $425 going, um, being covered by the buyer, but typically that is the seller cost and would be shown in the seller column. And then the last item on line 1304 would be for the HOA transfer or quote fee to the HOA for $100. So when you total up that whole column, it comes out to the $28,608.32, which if you flip back over to the first page, is the same number reflected on line 103. And then the last charge that we have for the buyer is that credit to the seller for the HOA for the remainder of the year HOA balance for $108.36. So when you total the sales price with the total settlement charges and the HOA debit, the total amount of cost to the buyer comes out to $478,716.68. Next, we'll go over the 200 section, which is all of the credits for the buyer. On line 202, we have the principal amount of loan credit for $350,000. On line 204, I'm showing the earnest money for $3,500. On line 207, the buyer is being credited back for the $100 option fee. On line 208 is the seller contribution credit for $1,200. And then on line 209 is the credit for the owner's title policy minus the survey endorsement for $2,819. And then the last credit that we have to the buyer is for taxes from the beginning of the year through closing for $11,325.50. So when you total up the credits of $368,944.50, and apply them to the total amount of debits. The total cash from the buyer on this is $109,772.18. Mm -hmm. So at closing, this is the moment when I would say, do you have a cashier? <laughs> <laughs> or a lot of times the buyers will wire the money in in advance, especially if it's a higher amount. So. If there's a closing date set, and for some reason at the last minute they have to postpone is there a charge or penalty for that to postpone it for each day or um it depends it could not from us i mean it could be something that if the seller might ask for it might be negotiated i've seen that happen before mm -hmm. um, because it does cost the money money for the seller for every day it doesn't close they've got interest on their payoff yeah that's what i thought and um taxes for every day so it's something that can be negotiated but, um, you know, a lot of times the date on the contract is kind of like the target date, almost like the due date for a baby, you know? <laughs> so we're really, really happy when we actually yeah. hit that date. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes they close early and sometimes they, they, they get delayed. I like that uh, analogy. So, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of analogies between. <laughs> sometimes there's complications. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes everybody has to go on bed rest. Recovery. Now I was just going to say it's a lot of. I think the fun part of our job is, um, especially on residential closings, when you get to meet people who are so excited, you know, and and get to be there when they get their keys, and you know. There's, There's a lot of things that are not so great when you're dealing with, you know, maybe a bankruptcy or divorce, but, you know, it usually comes out to be a happy time at the end. So. It's very rewarding to hand someone the keys and say, congratulations, you're now a homeowner. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the same thing about real estate. Yeah. I mean, that's what, you go all through this, and that I think that's the best part of it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you guys are helping people with the biggest thing that a lot of them will ever do yeah. I mean, besides having children and getting married you know, <laughs> yeah, that was so exciting. Providing I mean, love love that family. side of it but like you said the divorce side or the other side you know I went into this thinking that it's all going to be wonderful because you're selling houses and everybody but then the whole listing side of it isn't always that awesome because it's going mm -hmm. to be a divorce situation or an estate situation where I was like that's not fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for first time home buyers, they're scared. They're making a big purchase, like you said, so they got a lot of questions and they want to know everything. Mm -hmm. I personally love working with first time home buyers. Yeah. You know, um, they're so excited and yeah, they're yes. nervous that most of the time we can just have a conversation at closing. Mm -hmm. And 
yes, we have to go through all this paper, yeah. but we can also talk about where they're coming from. And you know, we meet so many people that are in multiple changes in their life all at one yeah. time. Yeah. 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 Well, I only might know a little bit more than a first-time home buyer, but I've had other savvy people that I feel like I'm thinking, you don't have a license, and you know more than I do. No. <laughs> <laughs> that won't be true for very long. I hope, I hope not. So, as, as an agent that's attending a closing, um, you know, our role is just, just to be there for moral support, really, because we don't really, I mean, yes, I guess you can review this for another set of eyes, but as many times as I've bought and sold my own properties and stuff, I'm still about as, I mean, I'm, I'm just a trusting mm -hmm. person that assumes that's correct and that's probably not something we should always do, but um, it is, every time I go over one, it, it gets a little more clear, but still, it's it's one of those things that mm -hmm. how, when I did this two years, or for two years, 10 years ago, um, we had a, a, a person in our office, I guess she had a broker's license and she was just there to answer our questions, you know. And so when I would get mine, I would go to her and say, okay, <laughs> is this right? <laughs> you know? So, and you can always call us before and say, do you mind going over the closing statement until mm -hmm. you feel more comfortable going over them. I've, I've had agents bring me, um, they had to close at another title company for some reason. Can we set up an appointment to come in so you can look over all the paperwork mm -hmm. for me and help? And yeah, that's not a problem. You know, just come on in. and So that would be the benefit of having a rapport with, you know, a closing right. agent, somebody that you can call in those questions uh, even if you can't use them. Anymore. And I've done several closings for agents who told me, you know, this is my first closing. Well, I knew that and they knew that, but nobody else in the room had to know that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it was something that we could talk about and, you know, I would never want it to look like they didn't know or were in inexperienced. Mm -hmm. So just okay. to know there might be more questions during the process um, and that's how we all learn, hopefully. You know, because ultimately we all work together as a team to get these people in this house or out of the house. So, you know, and we all need to work together to do that. So, mm -hmm. on this earnest money, is there a, a, a <coughs> typical amount, or the, it's up to who to decide how much they want to get for earnest money? The buyer? I think it's up to the. I mean, I, I'm thinking that it's up to the buyer to say what they're going to offer. You know, when they make the offer. It, it is what part of the expect? offer. It is. It usually has something to do with the percentage of, of the house, and the, you know, as far as it is to show how sincere they are about buying. You know, yes. so usually, but it's a negotiable. You know. I see a lot of times one person, mm -hmm. or a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred, depending on. Yeah. Yes. Those are the the most common. Yeah. Um, and that's really the thing to bring up too because it, a lot there are times when for some reason or another the contract does cancel and we have the earnest money. So then it's the question of what can we do with that? What are our rules of what we can do with that earnest money? And it, it depends. If it cancels during the option period and we have an option receipt then we can return the earnest money to the buyer without a fully executed release of lien, yes. uh, release of earnest money um, signed by everyone. Okay. Um, unless somebody called us and said, don't you dare. <laughs> and then we're, then we're put on notice and that kind of freezes us. But, um, but other than that, we have to have that fully signed release of earnest money by everybody. So, and if, and if that doesn't happen, Eventually, the money gets it goes to the state. So it, I don't know how long it's held. We don't have to be involved in that part. But I mean, every effort is made to try to help them come to some resolution. But we do have to have that signed by everyone. Mm -hmm. So, or follow the terms of the contract because that that release of earnest money page that you send mm -hmm. um, that is separate from a demand. So if you read that little part of your contract, um, you can send us a demand and then we have to follow the terms there of sending it to the other side and waiting the 15 days to hear, see if we hear back from them. And if we don't, then we can release it back to the party that made the demand. Right. So. 
Maybe we should have a test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Don't test questions. me. I did. Did you get cleared up? What was my question? I don't know. You were raising your hand. Oh, that's whenever they were talking about the first time home buyers. I was like, oh, I'm the one. Are you a first time okay. home buyer? I was. I decided to rent for a year. Oh, okay. Because I was in a really big hurry to buy. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, maybe I'll rent.